Hello, my fellow friends, and welcome to Dark Horror Diaries. Something happened to me the other night, and I figured I could contribute my own story about how I found out my neighbors are terrorists. I'm sure a lot of you already know this, as it made its rounds in the news, but a few days ago, on October 7, 2020, there was an FBI raid on a trailer in Michigan. This story takes place the night of the raid around 7.30 p.m. My boyfriend was at home sleeping when I came home from work around 6.45 p.m. I drove into our neighborhood and turned down the street to our house. All seemed normal as I go inside the house to rouse my sleeping boyfriend and we prepare to gather our things to go shopping. It takes me a little while to wake him up, and we chat for a bit about my day. As we go to leave our house to go shopping, we're continuing a conversation we were having as we step out onto our front porch. I notice then that we're much louder than the outside and notice that there were people standing on the end of the road. I stop mid-sentence, and it's then I realize how eerily quiet it is aside from my boyfriend who is still talking, unaware something was off. I quickly tap his shoulder and try to draw his attention from locking our door to the people gathering in the street. We both look around and I then notice a police car at the other end of the street just barely in view. There were two officers speaking to some men beside their large SUV. The SUV was a state car that was parked somewhat sideways so it was blocking the road, but it had its lights off. I took this as a sign that some mild neighborhood scuffle had occurred and someone called the police. A noteworthy thing but not too uncommon for a mobile home park. We proceeded to our car and I commented somewhat irritated that they better move the police car soon as they were really blocking the traffic. As we made our way out of our driveway, another car turned down our street and headed up the road towards the police car. This gave us the confidence we needed as sheep to follow someone else towards the confrontation. As we slowly crawled up the street in our car, we watched the car in front of us stop and turn at a road that had been left unblocked just in front of the police. We moved to this area somewhat recently and haven't learned the entire ins and outs of every street in the park yet. Unfortunately, this street was a dead end. As we rounded the corner on the dead end street, I caught a glimpse of the police and my irritation immediately melted into confusion and fear when I noticed the large assault rifles they were carrying. It dawned on me as we made our way toward the end of the road that whatever the police were doing they weren't here because of some small neighbor fight. I felt my anxiety rising as I started rambling about how they had guns and why would they have such massive guns outside our house. We turned the car around, and as we came back up on the police blockade, they silently motioned for us to go back down towards our house. We did, but eager to still leave our neighborhood and also hopefully find out what the hell was going on, we passed our house and turned down a different road to try going around. At this time we thought it was weird that there was a cop car with no lights on, but heavily armed officers standing by around it, but we didn't think that there would be any more. We were wrong. As we rounded the street we were immediately greeted by another police car and two more armed men. This time in full military uniform with lights flashing. I think my jaw dropped to the floor as the men started towards our car. I started really freaking out at this point and told my boyfriend to turn around and get us the hell out of there. As we turned around, I noticed out the passenger window that there was someone in handcuffs by the side of the house. He was looking right at us and I felt really sick. When we turned around we finally found a road that lead us out of the park and onto the main road. We got to the grocery store and recounted what had just happened on our trip to go grocery shopping. It took me a full hour to finally stop shaking and process. We thought it was crazy, but assumed it probably was some kind of high-profile drug raid. We found out the next day when the news broke that there were multiple people arrested in a thwarted plot to kidnap our state governor. 
The raid had taken place approximately 15-30 minutes before we left our house and our dumbasses had no idea. The second time we pulled up on the police blockade it was right outside the house the raid had taken place at. It really made me stop and reconsider everything that had happened that night and how suspicious we probably came across. I now have to come to terms with the fact I live down the street from domestic terrorists, or at least their house since I assume it's still in their name right now. I've made a point of figuring out multiple routes through our new neighborhood, because I realized how dangerous that could be in a more immediate emergency. I don't even want to think about what could have happened if they weren't stopped, and how much crazier that altercation could have been just down the street. I live alone in an apartment complex, and a few months ago this guy moved in upstairs from my unit. When I would leave or walk to my door, I would see him above the balcony watching me, and not even in an inconspicuous way, just flat out hanging over the rail and watching me. I ran into him once when he was walking downstairs, he commented that my dog was cute, and asked if I wanted to go upstairs to his apartment to give him a treat. I declined and he kept insisting, but I said no and walked back inside as fast as I could, I felt a very weird energy to that. At some point maybe a month later a couple of boxes of dog treats were at my door without a note which lead me to believe they came from him. Packages that said they were delivered were missing, so one day I checked the front office and what do you know creepy guy works at the complex. So he asks what my apartment number is, grabs a package from the back, and tried to initiate conversation, as I can tell he knew who I was. But I just pretended like I did not recognize who he was and walked out of there. It was then I felt really uncomfortable. This guy now knows my name and info. So I steer clear of him as best as I can. But then there are still weird instances going on where it says a package was delivered that was not at my front door, and they are either at the lobby or show up a week later out of the blue. Just tonight two packages were at my front door that I saw with my own eyes while I was walking my dog and I figured I would just grab them when I go back inside, but when I came back they were no longer there. I saw him walking on his way back to his apartment from his shift during the time I was outside, and I feel very strongly that he took them, and it all started to piece together that this could be some weird tactic of his. I don't know what to do, and he just gives really odd vibes off. I can't exactly tell the complex about the package issues, because he is the face of them, and I never see anyone else working there anymore. Every time I leave my apartment I try to scurry as fast as I can to my car, because he always tends to linger on his patio, and doesn't seem to care how obvious he is staring at me every time. Neighbor believed she was being stalked and preyed on by the man in the unit below hers. This happened when I was in elementary school. Me, my brother and mom had immigrated to Canada a few years prior to this incident. We moved into a rental apartment which consisted mostly of new immigrants. One day while we were waiting for the elevator a woman and her disabled daughter walked over and waited with us. They were speaking Farsi but a dialect that was spoken in Afghanistan, not Iran where we were from. This caught my mom's attention quickly and she was ecstatic to find out that a fellow Farsi-speaking woman was living just a couple apartments down from us. They began speaking, and it was evident that her daughter was not able to speak or communicate via sign language due to her severe disabilities. My mom and her would bump into each other frequently around the building and neighborhood. The man she believed was targeting and stalking her daughter was a single dad of a girl a couple years older than me. I knew them both well and I even babysat their dog a couple of times. His daughter told us her parents had divorced and her dad got custody of her. One night me and my mom had just gotten home and were stepping out of the elevator when we bumped into the lady. She approached us and said it was her daughter's birthday and insisted we join them for some cake. I always felt very weird around her 
and was not eager to join them at all, but my mom said she felt bad and that we wouldn't stay long. We followed her into the apartment and immediately the hairs on the back of neck stood up. Her daughter was sitting in the dark with only a small night light lighting up her furnitureless house. In the middle of the living room was a cloth spread out picnic style that consisted of a few plates and forks and a homemade cake. We sat down and were starting to get comfortable when my mom's phone started to ring. This startled all of us. Just as my mom picked up the phone, the lady hurried into the living room she was in the kitchen making tea and told my mom to put her phone on silent. She said you need to be as quiet as possible so he doesn't know we're home. I immediately shat my pants. Who was she talking about? My mom apologized and asked her what she meant. That's when she started telling us that the man from the unit below her is tormenting them. She went on about how he hits the ceiling with a broom on all hours of the night to let them know he knew they were home, and that one time her daughter was lured onto the balcony by him and was being persuaded by him to jump. She said he would knock on their door in the middle of the night and would whisper the devil's prophecies through her door. My mom asked her why she never reported this, and she said she was scared he would find out and kill them. She said they don't turn on the lights, they don't own a TV, and she never makes noise and only whispers when home. We had cake, thanked her for inviting us and got up to leave. She tiptoed to her door and motioned with her hand to stay out of view of the door, and we did. She slowly opened the door and peeked outside looking left to right, turned to us and said we were okay to go. As soon as we got home, I told my mom that there was no way what she was saying was true, because I knew the people who lived in that unit. My mom said it was best to not get involved and forget about it. Weeks go by and we don't see her or her daughter. One morning I was leaving our building to go to school when I noticed letters taped onto walls of the lobby. They were scattered, but I was a kid and thought they were letters put there by the building management. I opened the lobby doors, and that's when I saw the letter taped to the building intercom. The letter was written by the lady explaining how terrified she was for her and her daughter's life, and how no one has done anything to help her with the situation despite numerous attempts. She went on about the same things she said to us. The last paragraph sent chills down my spine. She claimed that she was impregnated by a demon in her sleep and now he has found her and her daughter QND possessed this man. She said if something happens to either of them that we should find ourselves responsible. I ended up asking the girl and her dad what that was all about and her dad claimed to have only ever seen her twice, both times of which he hadn't even made eye contact with her because she was talking to herself and he was creeped out. He said she would slide notes under his door with what he later found out to be Arabic writing. He said he showed it to one of his Arabic friends who confirmed they were verses from the Quran that is used by Muslims to protect themselves from evil. He said he had no idea it was her doing this till the letters started being plastered around the building on every floor. Apparently they were asked to move out of their apartment and she had threatened to light herself and her daughter on fire. The management had contacted the police for being a threat to herself and others. After a while we forgot about it and went on with our lives. We moved to a different part of town not too long after, but this event has always stuck with me. In 2015 I went back to the old complex due to reconnecting with a childhood friend who still lived there. I ran into the building manager, and he and I got to talking and I asked about the incident, and if he ever found what really happened. Apparently the lady was schizophrenic. She was a victim of forced marriage at a young age, and her daughter's disabilities were the result of the extreme abuse she endured while pregnant. Extremely sad. Turns out she was extremely mentally ill and full-heartedly believed the claims she had made. Apparently her daughter was in fact capable of speaking, but her mother did everything in her power to isolate her from outside contact and society. Me and my mom thought she was around 14-16, but turns out she's a 30-year-old woman. 
She was very malnourished and lacked personal hygiene, and was obviously not properly taken care of. Her daughter had never once been to a hospital or school. I have updates, but I didn't expect it to be this long, so if you guys are interested, I will post an update. Creepy Upstairs Neighbor Yesterday while taking out the trash I had an encounter with my upstairs neighbor that left me feeling really uncomfortable. For reference, I'm a 27-year-old female, 5 foot 5, 115 pounds. My husband works long distance and isn't home the majority of the time and we have a toddler. As I am walking back up to the apartment, a neighbor, Brian, is sitting in his car and rolling the window down. He asks, so your man's been home more recently? I told him that yes, we're very lucky that he's spending more time at home and that we have family that checks in on us. He asked if the blue truck is my husband's, which it is and asked if we know when my husband will be back. I lied and said that I wasn't sure, that he just shows up whenever. My alarm bells started ringing. He then proceeded to ask if I was planning on being home this weekend. I gave a generic, I'm not even sure what my plans are. Then he tells me that he knocked on my door the other day to see what I was doing. I was honestly shocked. I told him that my baby was inside and I had to go, immediately asking my husband to call me to tell him what happened. I double checked that all doors and windows are locked. Monday we're planning on getting some kind of security system installed. I don't even want to go outside anymore. He's out there a lot of the time, either in his car or talking on his phone out front. Hopefully I'm just overreacting and he was just poorly hitting on me. I live in a downstairs flat in a small block surrounded by other small blocks. Some of my neighbors are very trashy and are always shouting and arguing. No exaggeration the police must be called out at least once a week because one of the neighbors has caused a disturbance. A few months ago at about 10 at night, from the lounge I could see my kitchen window and something caught my eye. I got up and went to the window and there was a man standing there with his hands up looking through. As I approached the window he started to knock on it. He looked really rough maybe like a junkie. I told him to go away but he continued to just stand there staring in. At this point I was starting to feel a little uneasy so I told him I was going to call the police. He kept smiling at me in a really creepy way. Then he just turned around and walked off without saying a word like nothing ever happened. I think he lives somewhere near me as I have seen him since. We have never spoken about his strange behavior that night. He still really gives me the creeps. I know he was probably just high on drugs. So, I live in a commercial building in a pretty conservative country. Underneath our flat, there's a dental office and the owner is in good terms with my parents. So my dad arranged for my front teeth to be pushed back without braces, as they are just mildly outwards, not too much, so the owner who's the head dentist decides to do it with retainers. Since I live in the building, I usually go after all his usual appointments are done so that I don't have to book appointments in advance and he can see me for a longer time. I usually went there with a guardian or someone from my dad's office, which was one floor above our apartment, but this particular day, everyone was busy. Usually, a female dentist used to see me, but today nobody was there except the head dentist. Not even the receptionist was there, the entire place was empty, and it was around 9 p.m. and I was alone with this guy. So I know this guy to be a little touchy-touchy with other dentists, but he hadn't tried anything with me, so I didn't think of myself to be in danger or anything. But for some reason, as soon as I entered the room, I felt a certain uneasiness I can't quite explain. He is super trustworthy as he is like this ultra-religious person and my parents know him and stuff. Also I'm in my building, what's the worst that could happen right? 
Anyway so when I go, he is tightening up my retainers and is checking if it's fixed when I feel him pushing his penis against my leg. And I'm like WTF, and thought maybe he didn't realize it. But then he changes the position of the chair and starts doing it more. And at this point he is almost on top of me as he tries to check my teeth. At that moment I was just scared, because it occurred to me that I'm completely alone here, so nobody could hear me scream, and he had dental stuff in my mouth, which was weren't letting me talk let alone scream. The entire time I was just trying to move away from that position, but he wasn't letting me. And then finally when he goes away, I just said goodbye and left. Now, as I said, I live in a very conservative country where you don't really talk to your parents about anything sexual. I learned about the birds and the bees online, so when I asked by my father why I don't want to go for my next session, I couldn't say anything aside from that I was uncomfortable with the male dentist. I think he understood what I meant so he never sent me there again. And I still have outward teeth because I'm traumatized and creeped the heck out. He was watching me in my window. Posting from an old account I no longer use since the username from my main account is the same as all my other socials and I would like to remain anonymous. This story is about a neighbor I had once been fairly comfortable around, but that relationship changed nearly overnight, and he started making me insanely uncomfortable to the point I broke my lease and moved. I had lived in the same apartment complex for two years and across from me was my neighbor Sam. He seemed like a normal guy and a single father of three. Over the two years I lived there we had engaged in small talk many times and I believed he was a nice person. He felt like a father figure since he's twice my age and always seemed willing to help out if I needed it. Last summer my region experienced an insane heat wave that we simply didn't have the infrastructure to deal with. It's common for apartments and homes in general in the northern U.S. to not have A.C. Temperatures were aiming to reach over 100 degrees, and without A.C. we all would have had to prepare to basically endure 90 plus degree heat in our homes with no relief. I had purchased a portable A.C. unit and me being from the southern U.S., I didn't have the slightest clue how to set it up and all online advice was only useful for windows that slid vertically. I had a unique dilemma given that my window slides open horizontally. After struggling with the AC vent for a while, I decided to knock on my neighbor's door for help. That turned out to be a big mistake. After leaving my apartment he started sending text messages that made me feel quite uneasy. The first message was something along the lines of, I could tell we were nervous around each other. I'm shy. What are you up to tonight? I was honestly grossed out and disturbed by that because it seemed delusional. I wasn't nervous around him at all because I'm simply not attracted to him yet in his mind I was nervous. I didn't reply. He proceeded to text me and call me every day and was even leaving voicemails. He even blew me a kiss in one of the voice messages. I was starting to get scared because normal people don't continue to call and text someone that's not responding to them, yet this guy wouldn't leave me alone. I figured if he was this unhinged then outright rejecting him and telling him I wasn't interested could possibly be dangerous, so I continued to ignore him. If I was coming home at night, I always had a friend on the phone with me in case I bumped into him. I was becoming so on edge by all the unwanted contact I called my cousin, who was a lawyer, to tell him everything that was going on. He asked me for my neighbor's full name. After looking him up he found out my neighbor was a convicted quote woman assaulter in a sexual way. He had been in prison for five years for assaulting a twelve-year-old. He was also able to find out that my neighbor had been arrested back in 1988 for armed burglary. These are just the times he's been caught. I searched for a new apartment and the one with the earliest vacancy would be three weeks out. I had to wait. I went to the leasing office of my then current apartment and told them everything that was going on and opted to break my lease 
and move out as soon as the new apartment was available. I'm so grateful I had a male friend over this particular night. The vent for my portable AC had fallen out of the window, and I was fiddling with it and trying to get it to sit tight like it was before. While doing so I got another text. It was my neighbor. It said, I see you. You're looking really good today. Would you like some help? Upon reading that I realized he must have been outside and watching me in my window. I was shaking with fear. My friend saw how scared I was, and when I told him what happened he went downstairs to confront Sam, pretended to be my boyfriend, and told him to stop texting me. I was so shaken up I called out of work and booked the next flight to my home state to wait the remaining three weeks out at my best friend's apartment far away from my creepy neighbor. I wasn't even going to allow for any possibility for things to escalate further. Fast forward three weeks. I had hired movers to get all my stuff out of my old apartment. I was cleaning out the fridge and the neighbor and I ended up coincidentally leaving our apartments at the same time. When we made eye contact he licked his lips. That was the last time I saw him and I'm so glad I moved. I had a memory resurface recently which I had to double check with my mum for reassurance and she confirmed is unfortunately true. It was triggered by someone on the street outside my job, peeking inside through a very small window. They were harmless, but the sight of their face suddenly reminded me of a memory I had long forgotten from the first house I lived in as a child. We moved out of this house when I was six years old. A fence was built around the time I was old enough to start walking, but my parents were still always weary of letting me outside until we moved away. I used to resent it, but now I think I understand why. Apparently, we had a neighbor a few doors down who was a registered S offender. He had been required to notify his neighbors via his social worker when he moved in. He had a habit of doing odd, off-putting things around the neighborhood. He once sprinted across the street and left a human-sized dent in our neighbor's garage door. He had also walked into another neighbor's back door trembling and asked to be held by her. She kicked him out and called the police when she discovered he also had an erection. I found a lot of this out through researching his name after my mom confirmed my story. I also found his Facebook page, which included a photo of him, and sealed any doubt in my mind I had imagined it. His face was as clear as day the man I remembered. The sight of him even through a screen immediately made me nauseous. My memory tells me that I was sitting in our living room watching TV when I felt someone watching me. It was the middle of the day, and I turned to look out our front windows to see a man with his face and hands pressed against the glass. That same man I saw in the Facebook page. He was smiling at me with huge eyes and an even more alarmingly huge grin. I remember being scooped up in someone's arms and carried away into another room. My mum confirmed this would have been my grandma, who was babysitting me at the time. I'm glad we moved. This happened back at the beginning of February. I had been living alone in my apartment, now my fiancé lives with me. I don't know any of my neighbors but one that lives right beside me. I work overnight at a big chain less than 10 minutes from the apartments. I go home on lunch break, 2 a.m., and clock back into work at 3 a.m. The night this occurred, I hadn't had any music or TV playing, so the place was quiet. When 2.51 a.m. hit, I started to head out the door to go back to work. When I opened my door, a man stood there. I gasped and closed the door. As I did, I noticed a glass mason jar on the ground beside him. The second after I locked the deadbolt, he started shaking the handle. I told him to leave, but he didn't. I called my stepfather ex-military and 911. When the cops came, they found out he is my neighbor. He was very drunk. He lives on the top right side, and I live on the bottom left. 
Lots of people tried to tell me he probably just thought it was his apartment, but I don't see how since he had to walk down a flight of stairs to get to my apartment. My landlord said this isn't the first time something like this has happened, and if it does again he will be out. Just gave me the creeps. One night, I was alone at home. My parents had gone out of town, and I had returned from my friend's cancelled sleepover. As I entered, the lights were on. Shortly after, my friend called me on the cordless phone. It turned out to be the last normal thing that happened that night. My brother was in the next room playing video games, and I could hear him tapping the buttons on the controller while I was on the phone. I walked around the living room and ended the phone call in the kitchen. While in the kitchen, I heard a high-pitched squeal coming from somewhere in the house. I couldn't figure out its source, as it sounded the same in every room. It stopped about a minute later, and then the phone rang. Strangely, the phone wasn't where I left it in the kitchen. It was in the bathroom on the counter near the sink. I picked it up, but there was no one on the other end, so I hung it up. That's when I heard a dragging sound, as if something heavy was being pulled in the attic crawl space above me. I followed the sound as it slowly moved from one room to another, eventually leading me to my parents' bedroom, where they still had a water bed. The sound stopped when it reached the far wall, and then the phone rang again. This time it was my friend on the line. I explained what was happening and he advised me to be cautious and call the police. After our conversation, I lay down on the water bed. Soon after, I heard a knock on the door, and I rushed to answer it, but there was nobody there. At this point, I decided to call my brother to help me figure things out. I went into his room, but he wasn't there. His bed was neatly made, his room was exceptionally clean, and the video game console and TV were both off with the controller neatly wrapped and unplugged. There was no way he could have hidden and cleaned his room in the short time it took me to reach his door. I had been alone all night, and for about 20 minutes, I heard what I thought was my brother playing his video game, even though he wasn't there. My friend called again, saying the call had been cut off, and he was trying to call me back. I told him about what had just happened, and then I heard another knock on the door. I was right by the door, so I quickly looked through the window within a couple of seconds of the knocks, but I didn't see anyone there. Then I suddenly realized that, while I was talking, I had been looking at something very strange. It was a tall, skinny figure standing about ten feet away from me. What stood out the most was its inhumanly wide grin with oily mechanical teeth that stretched from one ear to the other. It looked back at me with two large, black reflective eyes. Even though I had been staring at this figure for more than five minutes, I pretended not to notice it with all my willpower. I calmly walked back into the house instead of running as fast as I could. I had a feeling that if I ran, this figure would chase me, and somehow I knew it would catch me easily. I stayed in my room and locked myself in for the rest of the night, too scared to fall asleep. When the sun came up the next morning, my parents were back home. Nothing like that had ever happened before, and nothing like it has happened since. A creepy neighbor stalked me and would ring my doorbell a million times. This happened to me a few years ago, it's a long one. I 24 female at the time had just moved into a new apartment with my roommate 21 female while we were finishing college. It had a pretty nice porch and front yard, so when it was warm outside I would often hang out in the front and read. The apartment was a duplex so we had the full top floor unit, and my neighbor underneath me had the full bottom floor. Most of the buildings around us were set up the same. One day I was sitting outside when a neighbor from the building directly to the left of us introduced himself to me. He was good looking, probably early thirties, seemed nice and normal enough. He mentioned that he was married and had a daughter, and that they also lived in the top floor unit. 
He said that it was nice to have other young people in the neighborhood, and maybe we could have drinks together sometime. I said sure in a, trying to be nice knowing we will probably never make plans kind of way and didn't think too much of it. After that, I seemed to run into him constantly. I would go outside and not even five minutes later, he would be getting the mail, grabbing something from his car, coming out to sit on his porch. There was always some seemingly innocent excuse that we bumped into each other, and he always wanted to chat. He became pretty insistent that he wanted to hang out, just us, never any mention of his wife being there. This made me uncomfortable, and I was ready with a vague excuse to brush him off. After one run-in with him, I left the house later to find a post-it note with his name and number on it taped to my door, telling me to text him so we could make plans. I threw it away. I mentioned this to my roommate and we both kind of shrugged it off and figured that even though he was weird, it still seemed relatively harmless. This is where it starts to get really creepy. It slowly became more and more obvious that bumping into each other all the time was not a coincidence. I had a night class one semester where I had to leave my apartment around 6.45 p.m. on Tuesday and Thursday nights. At this point it was winter time, so when I left it was completely dark outside. Literally as I would be turning around to lock my door, he happened to be stepping out of his apartment as well. Always wanting to chat, trying to make plans, etc. This definitely bothered me. But I was still in denial that there was a chance he could be watching me or knew when I would be leaving the house. One of these nights that I bumped into him, I came home from class and jumped in the shower. My roommate worked evenings so I was home alone. The apartment buildings were so close together that I could see creepy neighbor's kitchen pretty clearly from my bedroom window since we were both on the top floor. I usually had my blinds closed at night but it had been sunny that day and the apartment across from me was completely dark. I just didn't think anything of it and was walking around in my towel, sitting on my bed, playing on my phone, etc. Out of nowhere I see a flashing light in the window next to me. It took me a minute to register what was happening. Someone was taking photos of me from his kitchen window in complete darkness. I instantly closed my blinds and not even a minute later my doorbell rang, again and again. At this point I'm freaking out and realize it has to be him ringing my doorbell. I of course didn't answer and called my roommate, who told me she would be home soon. He probably rang my doorbell ten times before giving up. Finally my roommate comes home and I tell her what happened. We are sitting in my room on the edge of my bed talking. The blinds are pulled all the way down except for maybe four or five inches on one window. And since we were sitting, I guess you could still kind of see us, but just barely. As we are talking, we see flashing lights in his window again. Still completely dark in the kitchen. My roommate is like WTF and pulls the blinds all the way down. Doorbell starts ringing again. We both decide hell no to answering the door, and he probably rings about ten times before stopping. The next night I had night class. My doorbell rings around 6.40, right when I usually leave. My heart literally froze, thinking it was no way it could be dude from next door. Doorbell rings probably six, seven more times. I didn't go to class that night. This happens a few more separate nights, and at this point I have no idea what to do. I know it's him. I know he's watching me. I have no idea WTF he wants or what would happen if I answered the door. I consider calling the cops, but I am personally terrified of cops, so that is really a last resort for me. Soon after this my parents came in town to visit, and I hesitantly told them what had been going on, I didn't want them to freak out. Of course they freaked out, my dad installed and led motion light right above my front door, and a massive sliding lock. Although it was against my wishes my mom told my downstairs neighbor, a nice middle-aged lady, who I knew also knew him. After this the doorbell does stop ringing, and I'm able to successfully avoid him for a couple weeks. One day, I think I'm in the clear walking from my car to my front door when he comes rushing out of his apartment. He was so quick I really couldn't avoid him even though I kept walking to my door. He said he was sorry for scaring me, and that he was only ringing my doorbell and flashing lights in my window to try and get me to come outside not sure why this is a valid reason. He said he was actually moving and wanted to know if I wanted some nice bartending tools before he gave them away. 
I was honestly terrified of him and kind of frozen, but managed to say some type of no and go inside my apartment. When I left the house later, there was a box of bar tools on my porch. Finally, he moved away, and I didn't have to worry about leaving my house all the time. I ran into my downstairs neighbor who apologized for what happened. She said had lived next to them for a few years, and had no idea he would do something like that. She also told me that the reason they moved was because he cheated on his wife, and she left him and took their daughter. I saw neighbors standing and staring through my window. I live in a downstairs flat in a small block surrounded by other small blocks. Some of my neighbors are very trashy and are always shouting and arguing. No exaggeration, the police must be called out at least once a week because one of the neighbors has caused a disturbance. A few months ago at about 10 at night, from the lounge I could see my kitchen window and something caught my eye. I got up and went to the window and there was a man standing there with his hands up looking through. As I approached the window he started to knock on it. He looked really rough, maybe like a junkie. I told him to go away, but he continued to just stand there staring in. At this point I was starting to feel a little uneasy so I told him I was going to call the police. He kept smiling at me in a really creepy way. Then he just turned around and walked off without saying a word like nothing ever happened. I think he lives somewhere near me as I've seen him since. We have never spoken about his strange behavior that night. He still really gives me the creeps. I know he was probably just high on drugs. my creepy neighbor. Typically, I place a large box fan in my window at night, both for the soothing noise and to maintain a cool temperature in my room. While I've always harbored a mild discomfort about the possibility of my neighbors catching a glimpse of me through my window, I never anticipated anything beyond an inadvertent glance while I slept. However, my perception of normalcy was shattered last night when I found myself in a disconcerting situation involving my peculiar neighbor. Upon seeing my neighbor through his illuminated window, he was unabashedly gazing into my room. Initially, I dismissed it, attributing the unsettling image to a figment of my imagination, or perhaps an optical illusion. To my dismay, upon a second check, it became evident that my initial assumption was erroneous. He was still there, unrelenting and not a mere bystander. His unbroken stare, coupled with a disconcerting smile, sent shivers down my spine. The oddities exhibited by our neighbors have always been a cause for concern. Engaging in peculiar activities such as watering the lawn during rainfall and displaying excessive smoking and drinking habits, they've consistently been an unsettling presence. This latest encounter, however, has taken their peculiar behavior to an entirely new level, leaving me deeply unnerved. Being only 14 years old, this unnerving experience has left me grappling with a sense of vulnerability. I find myself asking, what can or should I do to put an end to these unsettling encounters with my neighbors? While their eccentricities were always present, the recent incident has pushed me to seek advice on how to navigate this uncomfortable situation. Dear Reddit community, I acknowledge that I might be overthinking this scenario, but the discomfort it has caused is undeniable. Any insights or recommendations you can provide would be greatly appreciated. While it might sound like a creepy story, I assure you it's not an embellishment. This encounter genuinely disturbed me, despite having faced scarier situations in the past. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to hearing your perspectives on this unsettling situation. I 21 male and my girlfriend 20 female rented an apartment for a month. The area was secluded, and after dark, everybody would mind their own business. Neighbors would hardly talk to each other, or even be outside in the evening. Our apartment was in a building with four floors, and each floor had a single apartment. All the apartments were very compact and built to be rented to students. The night we moved in, our taps ran out of water, so I went upstairs hoping to borrow some from the people living upstairs. I realized that two out of the four apartments were vacant and locked. The apartment on the fourth floor was lit from the inside, so I decided to ring the bell, but to my disappointment, nobody answered. Over the next week, 
We used to hear the sound of someone whacking a rod or some sort of metal on maybe the floor or some other object. This would start late at night, after 1.30 a.m., and continue for hours. Initially, we didn't care about it, but after some time it got us intrigued. The sound was clearly from one of the apartments above us, but as I already mentioned, two of the three were vacant for sure, and the third one seemed vacant, but was lit from inside. I knocked on its door many times, but no one answered. The whacking sound was a daily occurrence, and on some very late nights we could hear someone climbing the Buitling stairs. It seemed as if we were the only ones living in this building, especially during the day, and until the very late nights. We made up theories to convince ourselves that it was nothing, but the pattern of the whacking was too irregular for it to be made by wind or something other than a person. It would start almost daily at around the same time. We asked people around but didn't get any satisfactory answer. No one knew if anyone lived there. Towards the end of our stay, I saw a shady looking man going upstairs during the day. I asked him if he was the owner of the apartments upstairs, he said he was, also including the one on the fourth floor. I asked him if anyone lived upstairs and also about the whacking sound. He told me no one did and that he's looking for tenants. He said that he had no idea about the sound. To my surprise he then asked me, so for how long you're gonna stay here? Four more days, we'll leave on 30th of this month, I replied. He asked me if anyone else had rented the place for the next month, and I told him that I didn't know. So the strangest part is that for the next four days, there was neither the whacking sound nor the sound of someone climbing up the stairs late at night. However, my girlfriend's internship got extended by two days, and we decided to stay there, and just as I had anticipated, the whacking sound resumed after 30th the day we were supposed to leave. I don't know what it was, I won't ever know, but I'm just happy that we got out of the place without any consequences. It really scared me sometimes and feels weird thinking about it, even now. For two years, I lived in the capital city of a western estate. Two days ago, I moved to a smaller town about 50 miles away to be closer to family and get out of the city. It's not Skid Row or San Fran yet, but there is a massive homeless problem in my old neighborhood. Lots of petty crime, meth labs, and tent camps. I frequently walked past people passed out on the sidewalk. So when a neighbor in my small, eight-unit building wanted to hang out one night, I jumped at the chance to go out and safely walk around with someone. Also, here is a huge lapse in judgment. I always thought that Steve was kinda cute. So when he knocked on my door one night, I decided, what the hell? I'm moving in less than two weeks, and we hooked up. I also figured some of his weirdness went away since I'd known him for about a year or so. Steve was always kind of socially awkward. I could feel his eyes checking me out on the day I moved in last year, commenting on my skateboards. Another neighbor, Trent, was outside with Steve drinking a beer and having cigarettes. They seemed to be friends. After a few days, I began to have a beer or two and a bowl with Steve on his second floor landing that overlooked our alley parking. One day, after mooching too many cigarettes off of me, he told me my feet were cute. They certainly are not, and I'd known the guy for less than a week. I also made no intention of becoming involved with him because he was my neighbor. Really weirded me out. I actively avoid him for the rest of the year until a few weeks ago, just waving hello and stuff like that. Back to when he initially knocks on my door. We spend a few days hanging out, and he started to get stupidly clingy. Like if we hung out on Monday night, he wouldn't leave until Tuesday afternoon for work, and then want to see me again after he got done. Fine, whatever. I was getting laid, and leaving soon, so why not? One night, I ran out of smokes and wanted to pass by the corner store Trent worked at for more. He was always really pleasant to me, so when I saw him working, I bounded in without a thought and said, let's say hi, Trent is working. Atmosphere changed 100%. Trent starts calling Steve a piece of shit, asking him why he dared him to come in the store. F you, he said. Steve was silent. Trent turns to me, wishes me a good night and a warning. Watch out for this one, walrus, he's a psycho. Ah, uh, I thought it was just bad blood or something. Friends have falling outs all the time. 
On the way to the bar, Steve literally ignored everything I asked about Trent, a local skate spot, anything. Same at the pub too, so I told him I could just hang out by myself if he didn't want to say or do anything. I didn't feel like sitting in silence with a weirdo. Honestly, I remember leaving the bar and him trying to grab or hold my hand, but that's it. I drink too much anyway sometimes, so the amount I had was smaller than my regular. I didn't trust this F anymore. Next thing I remember is muttering to someone in bright lights, I'm not on medications, and then next it was in a dark hospital room with machines beeping. My face felt like it was on fire, so I searched around for my bag and pulled out my phone to see what the F was up. Two black eyes and huge swelling on one side of my face. I texted Steve to leave me alone, after I saw he sent me a few messages. He apologized that he panicked and was sorry. Whatever, dickhead, I thought as I fell asleep and was discharged later that morning. I got a lecture from a doctor about alcohol, discharge papers saying, I fell, and shoved out the door as the dirty, uninsured person I am. Over the next day or so, I got a lot of support. I told my family and local friends who didn't let me sit at home alone. I got help literally throwing everything randomly in boxes and booking a moving truck. I moved later that week with the help of a friend since I still had an eye swollen shut. Another guy friend, whose family owned dojos and does mixed martial arts, told me I got hit in the face by a person. Someone did this to you, Walrus. What's his name? I believe this too, since I had no scrapes or bruises anywhere else. I have back issues and would have felt that in my spine if I fell. On moving day, about four days after I was discharged, apparently, Steve sat on his ledge watching the movers pack my shit in the truck and watched someone load my car up. I didn't watch and purposefully didn't look at him. Who is that guy watching us? A mover asked my friend. She just told them that we had to get the F out, so I think that gave them some general ideas. Over the next few days of me moving shit in my car and on my move truck day, he kept asking me how I was, and that he was sorry and just panicked a few more times. So, before blocking his number, I told him I knew he did this, or was at least partially responsible somehow. I've gotten injured many times in college from drinking too much, skating, biking, etc., and never had this injury before. He told me that he getting pizza, and I just fell. Whatever. Then I went to urgent care since my hematoma was not improving and hurt and throbbed. I asked the doctor if I actually fell. She said no it was high high highly unlikely, especially after I showed her pictures of the injuries from before they relatively healed. So, who is to say, but I'll trust the experts before some weirdo who apparently wanted to sleep with me all year. I can imagine I told him to F off or something and he might have gotten mad. Can't really say, since I don't remember. On the day I return my keys and gather some small loose items with someone else, nobody would let me go over there alone over the weekend. I left Trent a note under his door warning him about Steve and sped the F out of that city. Apparently, as my friends were outside, he cracked his door open and stuck his head out. I can only imagine the glares he got. Him never going back. Nobody knows my address, Steve doesn't have a car, and I expect to never set foot in that neighborhood again. For now, I'm just healing and looking forward to new changes. Thanks for reading, ETA. Just wanted to say thank you for all of the supportive comments and advice. To answer the question of getting a RPE kit done at the hospital, I don't think they did. If they did, I'm sure they would have said something. As previously mentioned, the only physical wounds were on my eyes and face. No scrapes or bruises anywhere else. Also, if you're wondering, I used to live in Denver. Stay safe out there and always trust your intuition. When I was younger, my family and I lived on a ranch. We spent most of our time there. My brother and I were taught at home by our aunt, who lived in a small building on the edge of the ranch, while we lived in the main house. Sometimes she would come over in the morning to teach us basic math and English. My brother and I had a simple dream. We wanted to work on the ranch as stable hands. We didn't want regular jobs, so we didn't worry about getting qualifications or going to university. Our life was peaceful with no close neighbors. The nearest ones were about three miles away. However, 
We knew them well and visited the elderly couple a few times a year. Sadly, they're not here anymore. This particular event happened when I was 19 years old. I am 26 now. I think my brother was out with his friends, and my mom and dad had gone out for the evening. My aunt was in her little house, and when she wasn't in the main house, we didn't disturb her. It was a rule we learned from a young age. If you needed aunt, you just gave her a call. I had only been home alone for about 30 minutes. As I mentioned earlier, my mom and dad had gone out for dinner, which wasn't something they did very often. I wanted to go knock on my aunt's door, but I thought it might be impolite. I guess we were taught to be that way from a young age. It sounds silly now, but back then, I was afraid to knock on my own aunt's door. So I decided to call her to ask if I could come over because I felt scared. I was 19 years old, which isn't really young, but I was a shy and anxious girl. Being alone in this huge seven-bedroom house made me feel scared. Every little noise, like creaking floors and dripping water, made me very uneasy. I couldn't find any peace or relaxation, no matter how loud I turned up the TV in the front room. So I called her number, and she answered almost right away. She knew it was me. Emma, what's the matter? You see, I didn't usually call her, except for emergencies. Especially after she finished homeschooling us. Once, when I was nine, my brother got really sick and started vomiting because of food poisoning. That was when mom and dad called aunt to come and help. She helped us clean up all the vomit. I know it might sound tough, like she's a caregiver, but my parents have very demanding jobs. That's how they can afford this ranch and the house. Back to the phone call, my aunt picked up and asked, Emma, what's the matter? I said, nothing's wrong. Can I come over and see you? I told her that I was feeling scared and alone. It was completely dark outside by then, and even though I had turned on almost every light in the house because of my fear, I was still frightened. We lived far from any street lights. Our place was surrounded by more than a hundred acres of fields and land where animals grazed. When you looked out of the window, all you could see was darkness, except for the kitchen window where you could see a faint light from my aunt's house. But usually, those lights were so dim that you could hardly see them anyway. My aunt agreed and said, Yes, of course, you can come over for a little while. But she was getting ready to go to bed early because she used to wake up early to take care of the horses. I went to the kitchen door, took the key out of the lock, opened the door, and suddenly, I felt like my body and mind were swallowed by darkness. My imagination went wild, thinking about all the scary and terrible things like ghosts, demons, and killers. My brain was a mess, but I partly blame it on my love for reading horror and true crime. It's not a good idea to tempt fate with things that excite you, but deep down, you never actually want to experience. So, I decided to leave every light on in the house, even though my parents would be very angry if they came back before I left my aunt's. The distance from my house's door to my aunt's was very short, maybe just 30 or 40 seconds if you ran, but around 1 to 2 minutes if you walked. It was like a small part of an athletic track, so you can imagine. I stood at my house's doorway, looking at the lights in my aunt's house. Her window had the warm glow of her living room light. I didn't know if I should run or walk slowly. I was so scared that I started shaking. I turned around and closed the door firmly behind me, put the key in the keyhole, and turned it, making sure it was properly locked. Then I turned around and sprinted the whole way to her front door. So I didn't even bother to knock, as I was really scared and almost sure someone was chasing me. But they weren't. I was just being overly anxious. I remember my aunt mentioning that I came in without even knocking or telling her. I knew she might be annoyed, but she wasn't as strict as my mom and dad, so I knew she wouldn't scold me or hit me. In this case, I walked in and took off my shoes and joined her in the front living room. The place where my aunt lived used to be an old barn. It was converted into a cozy living space with my parents' help. She had her own kitchen, bathroom, a separate living room, and everything she needed, including a spacious bedroom. She didn't want a big place, even though we offered her a spot in the main house. She valued her independence, and some of her friends still visited her, although we didn't really get along with them. So, it was best for her to have her own space. My aunt enjoyed watching old TV shows from the 80s, and some were even black and white from the 60s and 70s. 
I thought most of them were quite dull, except for the James Bond movies from the 80s and 90s. They were pretty cool and interesting to watch. Unfortunately, she didn't play them often, but when she did, she'd invite me over because I liked those movies. I stayed at her place for a few hours until she kindly said it was time for her to go to bed. I was worried about the next few hours because my parents weren't coming home until 1 in the morning. It was only 10.30, and I practically begged her to let me stay. I tried to act like I was interested in the show she was watching, asking if I could stay and finish watching it. But she knew I was lying. She walked me to the back door, had me put on my shoes, and then let me out. As soon as she closed the door behind her, I ran in a state of panic. I reached the front door and unlocked it quickly. Later, I eventually fell asleep, even with all the lights on. But suddenly, the home phone rang loudly, right against my ear. It hurt, and the ringing was so loud that it startled me. Our home phone didn't have a caller ID to show who was calling, unlike a mobile phone. It was one of the oldest styles of home phones, but it was still cordless, so you could take it from the base station and walk around the house. Emma, you need to go to your bedroom and lock the door. Don't change any of the lights, and don't leave the house. Do you understand? My aunt had never called like this, and I had no idea what to think. Not sure what to ask her, I replied, Emma, just listen to me and do what I say, please. Previously, she had told me she was going to bed, and that was more than an hour and a half ago. So, I was genuinely puzzled about why she had just called me, but I was also curious at the same time. So, I opened my window, stuck my head out, and looked to the left. From there, I could see the south end of the house where the outbuilding was, where my aunt lived. Just as I was about to close the window, I heard some noises. I quickly opened the window again and looked to my left, thinking it was my aunt, but it wasn't. It was a man dressed all in black, and I didn't recognize him. I gasped as he almost looked up at me. I could see he had now turned and was facing the side of the house where my window was. I quickly ducked and closed the curtains as quietly and slowly as I could. Then I hurried to my bedroom door, opened it, and ran to my parents' room at the other end of the hallway. I opened their door and went to their front window. From there I could see the front driveway and I noticed three cars with their lights still on. The lights were shining on the property. Two men were standing with the car doors open and one was walking around the house. A few moments later I heard the phone ringing again. I picked up the phone and answered right away, expecting to hear my aunt's voice. But there was silence after a few seconds. I was still listening, and then a man's voice said, Your aunt is safe with us. I felt a chill run down my whole body. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I hung up and started screaming in my own bedroom. As I was screaming, I began to hear gunshots coming from the front driveway. My dad had arrived and started shooting at the guys. My aunt was found tied to a chair in her living room, and the men had done terrible things to her. She had called me when she saw them driving up the driveway. My dad had to defend our family, and he ended up killing one of the guys. He wasn't charged because it was considered self-defense. We had evidence that the other guys were armed because my dad always had a dash cam in the car. In the end, our family survived the night, and my dad's actions were deemed self-defense. But my aunt changed after that, and she became more like a robot. I called the police on the person sitting in my neighbor's parking lot. I don't know if I overreacted calling the police. I got home from work around 10.30 p.m. today. I went to go to my pretty typical after-work routine, check the mail, walk my dog, and eat some dinner. I went to go check the mailbox. There was a car sitting idle in my neighbor's parking lot. I've never seen this car here before. Headlights were on and a guy was sitting in the driver's seat. I live alone and my boyfriend was over to drop me off at home after work. I went to unlock my apartment door for him because he wanted to pet my cat while I was out walking my dog. I take my dog to her usual potty spot which is a pretty sketchy area with minimal lights. And that's when the guy who was in the pickup truck got out and started to approach me in the dark. He pulled out his phone and asked me if I had seen the lady on her screen. He showed me a picture of a lady who I could barely make out as she took up maybe one-sixth of his phone screen. 
He kept getting closer and closer, as I kept telling him no, I don't know who that is. He insisted that she lived in this apartment complex in Unit 20. My apartment is nowhere near Unit 20, it's on the other side of the complex. I kept backing away from him, and my dog could sense that there was something wrong with him and started to bark at him. She rarely barks until it's absolutely necessary. The more this guy talked, the more he creeped me out. He said he needed to know her location to make sure she's not a catfish, and he's not a bad guy because his kid is in the car waiting for him. At this point I knew I had to get out of this situation, so I practically sprinted inside and went to go tell my boyfriend what had happened. I asked him to come out of the apartment with me to see if the car was still there, and it was but the guy had gotten back into his truck, but is still parked in my neighbor's spot. While this was happening my neighbor had returned home and asked the truck to move out of his parking spot which he did, only to circle back five minutes later and park in the spot right next to my neighbor's car. This spooked the hell out of me, I had ended up dialing the local non-emergency line for some peace of mind. My apartment has an extensive amount of security cameras due to the high crime rate in the area. I'm wondering if I should report this incident to the apartment complex. I wanted to tell you guys about my mentally unstable neighbor, who I will be calling Kay to respect her privacy. Because I don't want to call her crazy or anything else that contributes to the stigmatization of severe mental illness. This story isn't going to be exaggerated to be more creepy or anything like that, it's just what happened. We had just moved into our new home, which we had recently built in a town in Texas. It started when my parents began finding small pills strewn about our backyard near the fences, just a few here and there. We googled the numbers on the pills to find most of them were antidepressants, but I cannot remember the exact names as this was about a year or so ago. But I think there was at least one pill that Google said was an antipsychotic medication. We were pretty confused, but mostly worried about our dog eating them before we could find them. This kept happening over a few weeks, and then we found unopened water and Gatorade bottles thrown over our fence. The side of the house this was coming from had a somewhat empty lot next door. We had soon-to-be neighbors building their new house there. But it wasn't like the construction workers were throwing their trash over our fence. These bottles were unopened and full. For reference, Kay lives a few houses down from mine on the corner. Between our house and hers are two empty lots, the lot closest to us with a new house being built there. After another week or so of this came the fights, or maybe incidents I should call them. Kay would routinely storm out of her house and go yell at the construction workers. I don't know what about, but apparently about nonsense things. Sometimes she would yell from her yard, sometimes she would walk onto the lot to yell. Several times she was seen yelling at no one, just standing in the lot or walking around the construction supplies and arguing to herself. By now most of the people on our street knew of her and were afraid of her. Up to this point I had never seen Kay. I attended university an hour away and was only home on the weekends. One weekend, my parents left me home alone in the middle of the day. I think they were at the gym or the grocery store. I'm an only child too. I had just gotten out of the shower and walked downstairs to hear yelling. I peek outside the windows to see a middle-aged blonde lady arguing. I couldn't see who she was talking to, but I could hear another male voice. Now I had not met Kay yet, but I also hadn't met my new neighbors, but my parents had. So my first thought was that this was the new couple building next door, my new neighbors. It seemed like they were arguing about the house. After a few minutes the blonde lady walks away, and then a couple come out of the unfinished house, and they get into their car parked on the street. I'm really confused at this point, especially when the man walks over to my door and rings the doorbell. I'm very introverted so I opted to not answer the door, kinda stupid I know. My parents weren't home anyway, so it wouldn't have made a difference I thought. After a minute he walks back to his car, and from the window I can see he is sitting there on the driver's side doing something. He comes back with a note that he leaves on my door, and then he and his wife drive away. After I'm sure they're gone I get the note and read it. Apparently, my neighbors were checking out the house when they saw Kay the blonde lady attempting to get into my backyard. They confronted her, and that's what the yelling was. 
In a rush, I sent a pic of the note to my mom, called my mom, etc. She didn't seem that worried about it, but I knew that we always left the back door unlocked during the day. If she had gotten through our fence gates, she could have easily walked inside the house while I was home alone. After that, my stepdad got some new locks for the little gate doors at the front of our house. Things continued like this for a while, with Kay trying to get into our backyard, throwing pills and water bottles over our fence. A couple times she was rummaging around our front flower beds, too. There was one instance which really unnerved my parents. We have a small alleyway that runs behind our house, connecting everyone's driveways. Another neighbor, who lives across the alleyway from us, contacted my parents to let them know they had seen Kay looming around our back fence gate at around 3 a.m. that night. Not sure why those neighbors were awake at that time, but they said Kay was just standing there in the middle of the alleyway, staring at our back fence. Knowing we had someone essentially casing our house in the middle of the night was really starting to freak us out. The guy who built our house, who I'm naming Jay, somehow got into contact with someone who knew Kay's family pretty well. Everyone was wanting answers to why Kay was acting like this, and since Jay had built most of the houses in the area and was well connected, people were asking him. I think he was friends with the realtor who sold the house to Kay, but I'm not sure. Anyway, Jay was able to give us a lot of information about Kay. Apparently her family was rich and owned a very big corporation, like one of the biggest in the US, I'm not naming it, again for her privacy, and her family had essentially placed her in this house away from the rest of them. They did not want to deal with her mental illness. But more importantly, two years ago her only son died of a drug overdose, and she's been unstable ever since. The reason why she wants to get into our backyard and keeps throwing stuff over the fence is because she believes her son is there. Not sure if she thinks we're holding him hostage or his ghost is here or what, but that's why. She's been to several psychiatric hospitals throughout her life, and now she's stopped taking her medication because she's throwing it over our fence. Things finally came to a head in January of 2020, when during one of her usual arguments with the construction workers, she pulled out an BB gun. She was already very aggressive, so the BB gun just made things 100 times worse. I don't know if she just threatened to shoot them or actually did, but the cops were called regardless. It took them a while to talk her down, with several police officers swarming the street with big guns. I am thankful that my parents had been filling police reports, so when they came they knew about Kay's history of mental illness. I am both grateful and a little surprised that they handled the situation so well, because not a lot of police departments properly train their officers to deal with mentally ill patients, especially ones experiencing psychosis. I still have ring camera videos of the police officers with big rifles loitering around our front lawn while assessing the situation. I might post that for proof, but I'm not sure it's necessary. Anyway, after that incident, Kay was not seen for a long time. We hear she was in a psychiatric hospital for many months, after which she returned to our neighborhood. She's doing much better now, she no longer does any of the strange behavior she used to. Almost every day me and my parents see her walk her dog past our house. She's clearly sticking to her routine and I am happy for her. This just happened and I'm sorry it turned out to be a long story. I got off work and went to my mom's to help her, and my dad set up a new Alexa TV they just got. It ended up taking a while because we had to run to the store to grab an adapter, so I didn't leave their house until about 8 p.m., and by the time I got home I recently moved a few weeks ago and live alone. It was close to 9 p.m. and pitch black. I have my hands full of a few things I forgot at my parents since I stayed with them for a month before I found my place. Anyway, I was walking up the sidewalk to my apartment when I hear him calling out to me. Him. Hey. Excuse me. Hello. Hey. He was politely persistent. I have one headphone and listening to YouTube stories, and I'm trying to pretend like I don't hear him. Not to be rude, but because it's pitch black outside, I've been up since 6 a.m. and I'm dead tired, I don't like small talk, and I'm bad at it. Eventually, I turn around and we introduce ourselves. Immediately, the hairs on my arms prickle, and I get this feeling in my gut. This guy is sizing me up. 
He wants to know where I live to see if he can break into my place, rob me, etc. It's just something I know. It's not even a feeling, but a fact. The entire time we're talking, maybe ten minutes, he has his hands in his pockets, his hood up, and keeps looking around like he's expecting to see someone. Granted, it's cold, but we live in as so it's not that cold, but this also puts me on edge. Then he begins asking about me, how long ago I moved in, which unit I'm in, etc. He's obviously going to see which unit I'm in when I walk into it, so I just tell him. He makes small talk for a few minutes and then asks if it's just me. I explain, oh no, I've got my two dogs. I go on to say how big they are, how protective they are, and how they are roaming freely in my apartment while I'm at work, which is all true. He asks if I take them on walks and how often. I hear, how often do you leave your apartment empty? I explain that I have to be careful because, while my dogs love me and act like big babies with me, they're very protective so going out is a challenge because I have to be careful of people coming up to us and how my dogs react to them. I turn the conversation around and ask which unit he's in, how long he's been here, who he lives with, etc. He seems uncomfortable and gives me vague answers, waving his hand behind him and saying, oh that one. He seems uncomfortable about me trying to clarify which apartment he's in so he tapers off the conversation and we say our goodbyes. I unlock my door, give my dogs a command to bark, which they do, and it's loud and vicious sounding. I immediately give them love and call my mom, give her his name, what he looks like, his vague portrayal at what apartment he's in, and remind her of our panic phrase so if I ever say it she knows to calmly end the call and send the police. Now I'm just sitting in my apartment freaking out at every little sound with my dogs piled on top of me typing this out. I'm going to call the non-emergency police and ask them to do a drive-by to make me feel safer. Update. I'm sitting on my couch replying to comments. It's 9.30 p.m. on a Friday night, and I'm hearing the softest knocking. If I weren't three feet from the front door, I wouldn't have heard it. I have both my dogs out, my pit barked, and everything is all locked up tight. Obviously, I didn't answer, but I don't have a peephole, so I have no idea who it was. Am I overreacting? Update 2. I just got home and noticed a light on in my car. The windows are up and the passenger side is locked, and you can only open the driver's door a certain way so I don't see anyone opening it, and his number is in my window on the outside with a message saying text me. On the back of the paper is information about a court date and such. I'm going to call non-emergency police and add it to my report and I've updated everyone keeping an eye on me, so yeah. I'm still freaked out. My senior year of college, I lived next door to a really weird dude. We lived in a house with a few rooms on each floor, and on my floor it was just me and him. Some of it was pretty run-of-the-mill, gross college boy stuff. His room reeked of dirty laundry from all the way down the hall, and when he would leave his door open, I could see that he had no sheets or blankets on his bed, just a bare mattress, and most of his stuff just lying on the floor or in boxes. This was months after we moved in, by the way. Then there was slightly weirder stuff, like how he watched the Military History Channel at 4am, at close to maximum volume on his TV, and the weird electrical zapping noises I'd occasionally hear coming from his room also always late at night. But the creepiest incident by far was when we had a house party. It was late in the night, and everyone was really drunk. I had retired to my room to hang out with my boyfriend. All of a sudden I hear weird noises coming from my neighbor's room stumbling around, slapping, struggling. I noticed but honestly didn't think too much of it, because he was always up to weird shit, and I was drunk and exhausted. A few minutes later, he knocks on my door. He is trying to get me to help him or something and keeps saying, I don't know what to do, she's passed out on my bed. I look in his room and sure enough, there's a girl lying on his still bare mattress. Suddenly those noises I just heard seemed a lot more concerning. I didn't know the girl and wasn't sure what to do, but thankfully a few of her friends showed up just then, took her out of his room and helped her find a safe place to rest. I'm still not sure what happened that night, I don't think anything too terrible happened to the girl, but it definitely could have if her friends hadn't taken her away.
so normally at night, I put a big box fan in my window. It's loud and keeps my room cool. I've always been uncomfortable about my neighbors being able to see me through my window, but I never really thought they would do anything more than an accidental glance while I was sleeping. Well, last night I got into a little scare when I saw my neighbor in his house with his light on, staring into my room. I just brushed it off and thought maybe I was just seeing something somehow. I checked again, and I definitely did not just see something. He was still there and didn't even turn back. He was just staring into my soul while smiling at me. Our neighbors have always been a little weird, always doing little things like watering the grass while it's raining, and they smoke and drink a lot as well. This was a very unsettling experience, and I am only 14. What could or should I do to stop my neighbors? They've always been kind of weird and creepy, but not to this extent. Thank you, Reddit. I might just be overthinking this situation, but it creeped me out so much. As much as I want help for this, it's also kind of a creepy story, but not horrible. I've been in scarier. I grew up in Arizona in a relatively safe city. Before myself or any of my friends had a driver's license, we would walk everywhere just to get out of the house and do something. Typically going to Circle K for soda and snacks or Walmart or Target just to browse around. One time when my two friends and I were 15 back, we were walking back to her house through her neighborhood around sunset. At that time, everyone in Arizona was fairly friendly, so whenever you would pass by another person or group, you would exchange hello or wave. This time in particular, we were walking past a house on a corner that had a kitchen light on where a middle-aged man was washing his dishes. When he made eye contact with us, my natural instinct was to smile and my friends was to wave. What a bad idea. The man immediately dropped his dishes in the sink, and what felt like one second later was outside on the corner staring at us in an aggressive stance with both hands balled into fists. All of our flight or fight responses were completely different. One friend immediately took off running in the other direction. My other friend peed her pants lol, and I was frozen in complete fear. He started charging toward us in full force, and I am so grateful that my friend grabbed my arm, and we all started running as fast as we could. I was so scared, I was last in place. The man was well built and appeared to be in great shape and had no troubles catching up to us. As I'm running, I can hear his footsteps very close behind me. He reached his hand out, tried to grab hold of my hair, but the adrenaline finally kicked in and I was able to speed off beyond his grip. After a while of running, we realized we were no longer being chased. We hid in safety and called my friend's mom to pick us up and told her what happened. We gave her the location of the house and all vowed to never go near that house again. The next morning, we wake up and her mom explains she checked the address of the house and someone living there was a registered S offender. Not sure if it was explicitly because of this incident, but my friend moved houses shortly after this. Our moms all collectively agreed we were not allowed to walk alone around anyone's neighborhood and that if we wanted to go out, a parent should be close by. I completely forgot about this until I was recently talking to my friend and she brought this night up. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if this man had gotten a better grip on my hair, but I'm thankful to say we got away unharmed. At 27 today, I carry a pocket knife and pepper spray with me at all times. Followed home by neighbor. When I was probably 13, 14 years old, one of my best friends lived about a mile from my house, so naturally she and I used to walk to meet each other regularly. Once I went over there late, can't remember exactly why, but our other friend who also lived nearby had walked to meet us as well. We probably smoked a little and had a drink because at that age it's scandalous or fun or exciting. So anyway I walked back to my house late by myself, it was probably about midnight. A man pulled up in his car next to me and insisted I get in the car so he could take me home after I had explained what I was doing. Something about his behavior told me he was not trying to be kind. I dismissed him several times while he trailed behind me slowly in his car. Eventually I did the classic pretend to be on the phone trick, naming my exact location and describing his car while I faked going home by ducking into a nearby house's backyard. 
Surely enough, he sped off as soon as he heard me giving his car description. I still wonder to this day if I could have been S. Used and murdered or something. Hopefully it's more innocent than it sounds, but if not, I hope he didn't harm anyone else. I lived in a cul-de-sac when I was about eight. My parents were friends with all the people there except for one family. There were two guys and I think their mother. One guy in particular was a marine and was home for some reason. At the get-togethers we would go to at our neighbors' houses, they would always talk about the marine guy being weird and how they got a bad vibe off him. I didn't really listen to them because when I was a kid, I always had this thing where I thought everyone was nice and a good person, and I didn't listen to them. I thought they were the people being irrational and not giving him a chance. Well, one day I was in my front driveway playing basketball by myself after school. My brother was in his room, and we were home alone as both of my parents were working, and would be home soon anyways. The marine guy came up on a four-wheeler asking if I wanted to take a ride. I said no because I genuinely didn't want to. He kept asking me, he was very persistent. After about five minutes of please and come on, he left. My parents were livid when I told them. We just saw his mugshot on the news. Child M. During high school, we lived next door to a guy that looked like Lionel Richie, and he had OCD, so he had a pretty strict routine that included trimming the grass around his flower beds with a pair of scissors because a weed eater made too much of a mess. He went to a small 24-7 gym at 1 a.m. every night, and that was the only time he ever left his house. He would come back around 6 a.m. and straightened out the brick pile in the backyard like clockwork every damn morning. We started noticing a pattern of women that visited him. One every two weeks, and then we never saw them again. Serial dater, no big deal. One night cops showed up to his house around 2.30 a.m., but he wasn't home. They noticed a bunch of us kids hanging out in the pool in our backyard and started asking questions about his routine and behavior as well as recent visitors. We never saw him after that. He never came back home from the gym and his house and belongings were sold eight months later. No arrest made, no obituary, no missing person. This story happened when I was in elementary school. My mom, my brother, and I had moved to Canada a few years before this incident. We rented an apartment where most of our neighbors were also newcomers to the country. One day, as we were waiting for the elevator, a lady and her daughter, who had a disability, came and stood with us. They were talking in a language similar to ours, but it was a version spoken in Afghanistan, not Iran, where we originally came from. This caught my mom's attention, and she was really happy to find out that this lady spoke the same language. They started talking, and it was clear that her daughter couldn't speak or use sign language due to her severe disabilities. My mom and I often met them in our building and the neighborhood. There was a man whom she thought was bothering and following her daughter. He was a single dad, and his daughter was only a bit older than me. I looked after their dog a few times, so I knew them both well. His daughter told us that her parents had separated, and her dad got custody of her. One evening, my mom and I had just come home and were getting out of the elevator when we ran into the lady. She came up to us and said it was her daughter's birthday, inviting us to join them for some cake. I always felt strange around her, and I wasn't excited to join them, but my mom felt sorry for her and promised we wouldn't stay too long. We followed her into her apartment, but something just didn't feel right. Her daughter was sitting in the dark with only a small nightlight in the middle of the living room. They had set up a kind of picnic with plates, forks, and homemade cake. When we sat down and were just starting to feel comfortable, suddenly my mom's phone rang. That surprised us. As my mom answered the phone, the lady hurried into the living room and asked my mom to put her phone on silent. Then she told us to be super quiet so that the guy wouldn't know we were there. I got a really weird feeling. Who was this guy she was talking about? My mom apologized and asked her to explain. That's when she started telling us that the man who lived in the apartment below them was making their life miserable. She said he would bang the ceiling with a broom at all hours of the night to let them know he knew they were home. 
She also said one time he convinced her daughter to go out on the balcony and tried to get her to jump. He would knock on their door in the middle of the night and say disturbing things through the door. My mom asked her why she hadn't told anyone about it, and the lady said she was afraid he would find out and harm them. She told us that's why they kept their place in the dark, didn't have a TV, and tried to make no noise, only whispering when they were home. We finished the cake, thanked her for inviting us, and got ready to leave. Then she quietly went to her door, signaled us to hide from the view of the door, which we did. She slowly opened it, looked outside left and right, then turned to us and said it was safe to go. When we got back home, I told my mom that I didn't believe what she was saying because I knew the people who lived in that unit. My mom told me not to get involved and forget about it. Weeks passed, and we didn't see the lady and her daughter. But one morning, when I was leaving her building for school, I saw letters stuck to the walls in the lobby. They were all over the place, but I was just a kid and thought they were letters from the people who managed the building. But when I opened the lobby door, I noticed a letter taped to the building's intercom. The letter was written by the lady, and she explained how scared she was for herself and her daughter. She said that despite many tries, no one had helped her with the situation. She talked about the same things she had told us before. The very last paragraph sent chills down my spine. She claimed that she was sexually assaulted and impregnated by a demon in her sleep. She then said if something happens to either of them, we should find ourselves responsible. I ended up asking the girl and her dad what that was all about. Her dad claimed to have only ever seen her twice. The two times he had seen her, he hadn't even looked at her because she was talking to herself, and he was very scared. He mentioned that she would slip notes under his door, and later he discovered they had Arabic writing on them. He showed one of his Arabic friends the notes, and his friends said they contained verses from the Quran that Muslims used to protect themselves from evil. He didn't know it was her until the letters started showing up all over the building on every floor. So they were told to leave their apartment, and she had threatened to harm herself and her daughter. The building management had to call the police because she was a danger to herself and others. After some time, we all kind of forgot about it and moved on with our lives. We moved to a different part of town not long after, but I always remembered that event. In 2020, I went back to the old place to meet a childhood friend who still lived there. I bumped into the building manager, and we started talking. I asked him about the incident, and if he ever found out what had really happened. It turns out the lady had a condition called schizophrenia, which made her see and hear things that weren't real. She was forced into marriage when she was very young, and her daughter's disabilities were because of the severe abuse she suffered while pregnant. She was very mentally ill and truly believed in the things she said. Her daughter was actually able to speak, but her mom did everything to keep her away from the outside world. My mom and I initially thought the daughter was between 14 to 16 years old, but she was actually 30. She was very undernourished, didn't take care of herself, and it was clear she wasn't being properly looked after. Her daughter had never been to a hospital or school, which was really sad. My next door neighbor was murdered. In 2020, I was in the second year of graduate school. Even before the pandemic, many of the classes were online instead of in person. Normally, this was not a problem, but since my parents lived in a rural area, I had to commute to use the school's internet for my schoolwork. When C pandemic hit, all of my tests had to be taken online, and the literal 3 Mbps my parents got on their satellite internet connection would not be good enough to help me with my schoolwork. If my university were to lock down and send the students home, I would have had to withdraw for a semester. Since this was not an option, I began searching for apartments in the smaller college town. After a short search, I was surprised to find an opening at a student complex three miles from campus. Not having any options, I signed a lease and moved in the next week. Eventually, my predictions came true, and the university locked down. I felt extremely lucky to have one of the few coveted spaces in town. Even as I walked into the office to get my keys, there were literally people crying on the steps. Did they know someone with C-flu? Did they have a bad home life? I thought. 
I genuinely felt bad for them, whatever their situation. I thought I had dodged a bullet. Little did I know things were about to take a turn for the worse, fast. The apartment was very poor quality, but it was the cheapest rent in town. It was all my stipend could cover, so I was happy to have it. However, the lack of a security deposit and the ability to pay your rent up front meant that, unfortunately, desperate people started to move in. About five months into lockdown, there seemed to be very few students left living there, and many of the remaining residents seemed to be in their 30s or later. I heard a lot of rumors about drug dealing going on in the complex, but wrote it off because every college except Bayou and Liberty has a large weed culture. Eventually, however, people started to find syringes in the landscaping and the gravity of the situation became more obvious. Rumors continued to circulate, but I wrote them off. That was until one summer afternoon when I riding home on my bike from Whataburger. My apartment was in one of the rear buildings of the complex, so I had to ride through the parking lot to get to my door. As I pulled through, I noticed four or five police vans parked in front of the building. It looked like a massive drug bust, so I called my friend Mike over to come take a look at the situation. He lived across from me, so it was a quick walk for him to come over. We watched the commotion from my balcony for an hour, speculating on what it could be. We both agreed that one of the dealers probably was busted and was on his way to prison. That was until we saw men in dress shirts and ties walking out of the complex wearing surgical gloves. We saw on the news the next day that the man living in that apartment was murdered in broad daylight after walking out of his apartment. Supposedly he was shot while exiting and died on the way to the hospital. We never found out why, and I don't think the police ever caught the person who did it. I don't know if they had a suspect. All I know is that I was glad I was out when all of this was going on. At the very least, I could have witnessed something that would have scarred me for life. I've since moved into another, nicer complex in the city, and don't have to worry about such things. Back in our grad school days, my roommate and I rented the top two floors of a three-story house. The renters on the first floor were a quiet couple the wife was always gardening and would wave or say good morning, but the husband was pretty standoffish. We were planning a garage sale and since it was a shared backyard, had alerted the wife about two weeks beforehand. She assured us there was no problem, wished us luck, and we thought nothing more of it. The morning of the garage sale, maybe a couple hours after we started, the husband walks out on the back porch and proceeds to lose his shit, screaming that we were not to do any activity in the shared space without his express knowledge and permission. I told him we had already spoken with his wife, and if they had communication issues, that was their problem, not mine. Furthermore, they were also renting, and nothing in the lease required mutual agreement to use the shared space, so he was welcome to F right off. About an hour later, the same neighbor walks into the backyard from the side entrance where customers would enter. It took me a moment to realize it was him, because he had changed clothes, restyled his hair, and put on glasses. He starts browsing, asking me about whatever crap we were selling, and makes no mention of his previous outburst. Then he asks if there was anything else we needed to bring down from the second floor. I told him no, he was all here. He starts to get anxious, glancing up at our balcony and back down, going, I'm sure there's more stuff. You should just let me up there and see what I can bring down. I tell him there is no reason for him to go up there. Now he's wringing his hands and almost whining. Just let me see. I know you've got more up there. Again, told him there was no way he was entering my home. We actively avoided him after that creepy day, but where he had previously been standoffish, from then on he actively sought us out. Usually when we were bringing in groceries or coming back from work. Always wheedling to get up into our apartment. Creeper next door. This was last night. I was standing near my driveway, watching my daughter play and my next door neighbor pulled up in his parking spot. I haven't really spoken with him, maybe a hi and bye here and there. He seems fairly normal, 50s, not unattractive. I just know that a woman and a 20-something guy live there as well. After introductions we chatted about nothing much. He did tell me several times that if I ever needed help around the house, 
he was a bit of a handyman. He knew I was single, but I didn't think much of it. He also kept saying that my six-year-old was a doll. He then popped a steel reserve, which I've been told is some kind of hobo beer. We finished our convo and parted ways. Me and the kid went inside for dinner. While it was cooking, I went to the patio on the back of the house to smoke. As a visual, we share a wall in our condos and have similar patios on the backs of our homes. You can't see your neighbors through the wooden dividers. While my daughter and I were out back, I can hear him on his patio. You can only see each other by leaning over the balcony. He strains to look over and can now see us. He told me about a conversation that I had several months ago. I guess he likes to listen to my phone calls. Weirdo. He said that he had heard me telling someone that I was going to ask my ex to help mount the TV and help me out with other things. The neighbor almost insisted that he come by to help and that he could fix anything. We keep talking for a bit even though I already knew he was of questionable character. He was also really concerned about the rings on my fingers. He also tells me that he just signed a two-year lease. He still kept saying that my daughter is a doll. Here's where it became gross. This dude keeps insisting that he can mount a TV, change a garbage disposal, etc. Then I see him put his hands up to his face, kind of like horse blinders. He then tells me he wants to get in between them thighs with his tongue out. Initially, I thought I heard him wrong. I did not. Once I realized it, and he was asking if I heard him, I was shutting down that shit. I gotta live by this mother f for another two years. Definitely told everyone I know, just in case. Lived in a three-story walk-up, top floor. Woman in the unit below me was in her early fifties, divorced, had a teenage daughter who came around very rarely. She was a mild hoarder from what I could tell. There was the inner stairwell in the building, but also a stairwell on the outside of the building that was more like a balcony with stairs between each level designed as a fire escape. She pulled the fire alarm one night at 3 a.m. because she saw ghosts. Regularly made eyes towards me, which was a little creepy in itself. But nothing prepared me for this last part. Came home wasted one night somewhere around 2.30 a.m. Realize I'd lost my smokes somewhere along the way, and I'm craving hard for one before bed. No stores within a reasonable distance in sight and lady downstairs is a smoker. Bingo. I remember her light being on as I went upstairs a few moments earlier. I head down, nightcap beer in hand and see she's sitting on her computer just on the other side of the balcony door. I knock lightly and she leers around the monitor to see my face, just a minute please, and she opens the door. I explain my predicament and she says, oh for sure, hold on a second. She comes back a minute later wearing the same nightgown she was in before. Only this time without a bra she'd clearly taken it off and at the same time turned her headlights on. She offers up the smoke and says, anything else you need, it sucks being drunk and not having a cigarette. And that's when I realized what was going on. Spoiler, did not hit it. Every now and then afterwards I along with likely most of the other neighbors would hear her getting herself off. That was disturbing. Moved shortly after. I was unloading my groceries one day when my next door neighbor called out to me to come over which was a normal thing. It was around lunchtime and they usually asked me to come over for some food and to hang out for a little bit. Let's call them Maria and John. We're a married couple. She was in her mid-thirties and him in his mid-fifties. They were always very kind to me and I enjoyed hanging out at their house. They had a young daughter who loved playing with my son so I was over there quite avid. John also had two of his own sons who were my age and regularly helped fix my car. I dropped off the groceries in the house and decided to make my way over. I let myself in as I usually did and sat down on the couch, but something seemed off. The house was abnormally quiet. I couldn't hear the kids or the boys, so I just sat there and waited. John came out from the hallway and smiled at me. He was an overweight man twice my size. I asked him where Maria and the kids were, and he told me they were out. I started feeling uncomfortable, but I thought this man wouldn't do anything he once told me. He saw me as his daughter, so I stayed and had a chat with him. 
It was all fine until he asked me if I liked Asian food. I said yes, and he asked if I'd like to go get some sometime. I asked if he meant with the family, and he said, no, just me and you. He was sitting uncomfortably close, and I tried to wiggle away slowly. He smelt heavily of tabaku and sweat. I said I'd go if he brought Maria. He then proceeded to tell me she was too busy with the kids, and that he wanted to have fun, and she didn't have time for him. He said he'd take care of me. Mind you, I was a recently single mother, and my partner moved out, so he knew I was alone. He pulled out some cash around $500 and tried to hand it to me. I know it's hard to raise a baby by yourself. I've got a lot of money. I can help you. You just have to have some fun with me. I knew exactly what fun meant. I could definitely tell by the way he looked down my top when he asked. I declined and tried to act natural. I had texted my friend to call me previously and she did. I snatched up my phone and answered it excusing myself and telling John I needed to go. I ran straight for my house and shut the door. When I went back out to my car after calming down, I really had thought he was going to trap me there. John was sitting out the front. He watched me intently as I walked to my car. Don't tell Maria about our talk. It's between me and you, he insists with this little smirk on his face. I am truly harfied to this day that this man I felt safe with tried to buy me. That he did this to his wife and tried to take advantage of a young single mother. I really liked that family, but I never went back there. Soon after that I moved out. So me female 13 live in an apartment building with my female 40 mom. My mom is married but separated. Before her and her husband separated, we lived in an apartment down the street, and we had a neighbor who I'll name him. M would constantly make my mom feel uncomfortable. For example, when my mom would get home and do laundry, she would put on her lazy bra. He happened to also be in the laundry room. He was talking to her and nudging her as some people do when making jokes and talking. But he was constantly nudging her around her top area, which made her uncomfortable. So fast forward five years they separate, and we move down the street. Come to find out he lives right next to us. When my mom would leave out of our apartment so would he and pretend to go get the mail. The first couple times seemed as a coincidence, but it just kept happening. So about two weeks ago we were going somewhere and my mom had to pick me up from home. She had to go inside for a moment, and I was ready to go so we just swapped keys. I'm waiting in the car sitting on driver's side on foot with my cousin. He pulls up and is starting at me so I make sure the doors are locked. So he gets out and I see him in the mirrors walking up to the car. I ignored him but then he knocks on the window. He started talking but I don't know what he said because I didn't roll the windows down. I was so scared I stayed on the phone until my mom came out. I haven't seen him since but I've kept my pocket knife on me when I'm alone since. On behalf of creepy neighbors everywhere I resent the implications in this thread. Oh sure you high and mighty redditors want to look down your noses at us, just because we kidnap cats, stare into your windows at all hours of the night and have toilets in our front yards. But what about all the good we do? Oh no, people never talk about that. No one ever mentions the Creepy Neighbor Neighborhood Watch Initiative. Did you know that since 1996 the Creepy Neighborhood Neighborhood Watch Initiative has been credited with reducing crime in Bay County, Florida, but 12%? No? Didn't think so. Or how about DeSoto County, Florida's bi-monthly Creep Neighbor Blood Drive DCBC NBD for short? For seven years the DCBC NBD has held our blood drive in Ray's mother's garage and we've collected, on average, 24 pints for the Red Cross. Maybe if your majesties would deign to get off Reddit and walk around your neighborhoods you'd see things like the Creepy Neighbor Campaign to End Child Homelessness. Based in Polk County, Florida, the CNCECH has helped over 17 homeless youths get off the streets by providing them with comfortable pallets Rob's basement. As of 2016, the CNCECH is proud to say that all of the CNCECH alumni to date have overcome their problems and become productive members of society, and that the molestation allegations against Rob have been thrown out of court on a technicality. So the next time you see a creepy neighbor looking through your trash for discarded clothing to smell, 
don't poo-poo them. Take some time to consider what that neighbor might be doing in their spare time and what they contribute to your block. I'm on night shift tonight, so I figured I'd finally type this out. It's been ongoing for a few weeks, but seems to be over. I hope at least. So I'm between places to live right now. My old apartment got condemned, so I 24 female am splitting time between my brother's house and my boyfriend's house while I'm finding an apartment. Unfortunately, we're in a hardcore housing crisis down here right now, so it's taking longer than I'd like. So my boyfriend has only been living here for a couple of months. He shares a yard with his neighbors, which is rented out by the same landlord. The neighbors gave me no bad impressions at first. It's a husband, a wife, a daughter, and somebody whose relation to the family was never made clear to me. He's a guy, though, mid-forties. So the first thing that kind of got me thinking was the fact that their bedroom activities could be heard. Loudly. Anytime they were in the bedroom and we were outside, we could clearly hear everything. This wasn't a hug bother, though. One night, around midnight, we could hear a chainsaw being used inside of their house, accompanied by screams. My boyfriend had the brilliant idea to go over there, but I convinced him that we just call the police. I don't know what the outcome of that was, but the next day we saw all of them at one point or another, and nobody seemed to have been hurt. The next thing I found to be strange was when the wife had come outside as I was leaving for work. She was wearing nothing but sweatpants. To make it clear, I saw titties. She just carried on doing what she was doing. The next thing, which seemed to be the final straw for my boyfriend, was when he and I were trying to sleep, they randomly started stomping on the floor inside of their house and started chanting. Not sure what they were saying, if anything at all, but he was getting restless. The next day, he went over to the husband and told them that they needed to keep it down. Both he and his wife were confused and played dumb. My boyfriend jumped to the conclusion that they were on drugs, and I won't lie, so did I but they argued profusely that they didn't do that. The verbal altercation lasted a few minutes before my boyfriend simply told them to stay on their side of the yard and to stay quiet. This lasted for a whole day before the wife had come outside, wearing nothing but a sports bra and sleep shorts, and fell asleep by their fire pit. I'm a nurse by trade, so I went to see if she was okay and found that she wasn't breathing. I called 911. An ambulance came and got her, along with two of the others, who were all unconscious inside of the house. I had remembered after all of this was settled that my boyfriend had said once upon meeting them that the wife had mentioned that all of their windows were unopenable. They had suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning. None of them passed during the ordeal, thankfully. All three survived, but I haven't seen them since and I doubt that they'll be back in the house. I guess what I'm trying to say is, be safe and make sure that your house is up to code before moving in. We are currently in the process of having his house checked, just to be on the safe side. I'm a 32 year old female, but this story happened when I was 13 years old. One night, I was at my friend Kate's house. Her house was in a not so safe neighborhood, not far from our middle school. Kate's mom was a single parent, and she was working late, so it was just the two of us. However, her mom had filled the house with lots of junk food, and let us watch as many movies as we wanted on demand. Since it was still daytime, we decided to take a walk down to the pond and the park, which was only a couple of blocks away from her house. On our way back, when we were only one or two houses away, a car came up behind us. I didn't know who this person was, but my friend did. She said it was her neighbor Andy, who lived right next door. Andy, as far as I can remember, looked much older, maybe in his early fifties. He had a sort of grayish beard and always wore a baseball cap. I didn't feel good about the way he smiled at us, even though I was just a thirteen-year-old girl. I didn't know this stranger, and I was surprised that my friend shared so much with him. Maybe she knew him better. Andy spoke in a quiet voice and said, Hey, Kate. I noticed your mom's car isn't in the driveway, so I guess she's working late again, right? Kate, being her usual friendly self, and not realizing anything was off, replied, Yep, she's doing the late shift, so it's just us in the house tonight. Andy gave that same weird smile and said, 
All right, you girls have fun with your sleepover and try not to get into too much trouble tonight. Then he slowly drove past us and parked his car in his own driveway. When we walked up the driveway to Kate's house, we noticed that Andy was still looking at us as he went into his own home. Once we got inside, I asked Kate about her neighbor because he made me feel uneasy. Kate agreed that he was a bit creepy, but she didn't think he was a danger. Kate was the type who trusted people easily and was carefree, while I was more cautious and kind of a goody-goody. So we made a pizza, gathered snacks, watched some movies, and chatted with our friends online. Later, it was close to midnight, maybe even 1 a.m., but Kate's mom still wasn't back home. We were starting to drift off to sleep in our sleeping bags in the living room. The TV was on, playing a scary movie in the background. All of a sudden, Kate muted the TV and spoke quietly. She said, I think I saw the motion detection light in her backyard go on and off. She then carefully got up to check out the window that looked over their backyard. I walked over quietly and asked if she saw anything. She didn't see anything at first, but after a while, we saw the light come on again. We did our best to see outside, but it was tough. Kate decided to go down to their basement to see if she could get a better look through one of the windows down there. We walked down the basement stairs, being careful not to trip in the darkness. We didn't want to turn on the lights just in case someone or something outside could see us. It was strange to see Kate taking things so seriously because she was usually the more relaxed friend. Maybe all those scary movies were making us both extra jumpy. In the basement, there was a big window next to a door on the far side. The motion detection light turned on again, and some light came through the window, letting us see a bit in the small basement. Suddenly, we heard the door that led to the backyard in the basement start to shake. We both got a big fright and let out screams. The window on the door had blinds covering it, so we couldn't see who was trying to open the door, but we knew someone was trying to get inside. Thankfully, the door was locked with a deadbolt, but still, we were very scared. Kate spotted a baseball bat on the sofa and slowly moved closer to the door. I whispered to her that we should leave and maybe call her mom or the police, but Kate carefully lifted a corner of the blinds on the door's window. The person on the other side was still trying to open the door. Kate pulled up the blinds and guess who we saw. It was her neighbor Andy. We both screamed when we saw him. Andy raised his hands and said, Whoa, it's okay girls. I didn't mean to scare you. I just wanted to make sure you're safe. It's really late and I thought I saw someone in your yard. Kate and I exchanged worried glances, then looked at Andy. There was something creepy and scary in his eyes, so we both felt he was lying. We knew he was the one trying to break into Kate's house. Kate told him to leave or she'd call the police. Andy just stared at us and said he wanted to make sure we were safe since he knew we were home alone. He reached for the doorknob again and wanted us to unlock the deadbolt. I grabbed Kate's arm and told her to dial 911 right away. I yelled that we were calling the police immediately and he better leave. Andy glared at us, then stepped back from the door. He quickly looked to the right, then turned and ran to his backyard. Kate and I rushed upstairs and that's when her mom came into the house. She asked us why we were in the basement and we both quickly told her what had happened with Andy. Kate's mom was surprised but didn't think calling the police would help because Andy hadn't actually broken in or harmed us. Kate and I were both really scared and wanted her mom to call the police to report him, but she kept saying that the police probably couldn't do much. Luckily, I didn't run into Andy again during the few more times I visited Kate's house. Not too long after, Kate and her mom moved away. I don't know what Andy wanted or what he was planning that night, but I'm very thankful we didn't have to find out. This was about nine years ago when I was still in college. One day I was driving home and I was about to turn onto my street. I saw a black truck parked off to the side of the street perpendicular to my street. Across from my house is a park, but it was empty. I saw my neighbor's eight-year-old daughter playing outside on their driveway. As I passed the truck, for some reason, I had the urge to look at who was in it, and it was a man in his 40s. He was looking directly at the little girl next door, and he wasn't taking his eyes off her. I had a sick feeling about him. 
I turned into my street, turned around and parked opposite my house where I usually park. I looked at the guy again and there he was, still staring at that girl. I took out my phone and took a picture of him in his truck. I kept my phone out as I got out of the car. Looking directly at him, I put the phone to my ear pretending to call someone and walked across the street towards my neighbor's house. I looked at the creepy guy the whole time. All of a sudden, I hear his car rev up and he peels out really fast. I immediately told the little girl to go inside. I did not know my neighbors at the time. We never really talked much, but the little girl listened and went inside. I was about to call the cops, but my mom unexpectedly called me. I told her the scenario and she kept trying to tell me to leave it alone and not call the cops. She said not to involve myself. This pissed me off. Side note, I grew up with parents that try to avoid trouble, and that includes not calling the cops when you witness something. I am the exact opposite. If I would want a witness to come forward to help me when I'm in trouble, I'll sure as hell do exactly that for others. Plus, I couldn't live with myself if someone else got hurt because I kept my mouth shut. I hung up on her and called the cops. I gave all the information I could. I wish I had done things differently, like check his license plate as I drove by, and I wish I called the cops from my parked car, so creepy guy would still be there when they arrived. Anyway, I'm glad the little girl was safe in the end. The neighbors and I became friends after that until I moved away. Don't be like my parents, people. Do the right thing. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.